Hola, ¿qué tal? Welcome back to this lesson in Spanish 590, Spanish 690, Advanced Spanish Grammar. Today's lesson has to do with grammar instruction and the learning and practice of grammar forms and structures. Um, let's get right to it. In today's lesson, what we're going to cover, we're going to look at some key questions to orient us. We're going to review some of the assumptions and objectives for the course. We're going to question those assumptions, right, initially, look at what our common sense and experience tell us versus what the experts have discovered. Um, I'll explain three key distinctions in a very superficial way from second language acquisition research and theory. I'll discuss a few factors that make a difference in the effectiveness of instruction and therefore practice. Uh, we'll take a closer look at some practice strategies. And finally, we'll offer some tentative conclusions. All right, so what are those key questions that orient this lesson? Well, first of all, should grammar be taught? Can it be learned? right? Because if it shouldn't be taught and it can't be learned, what are we even doing here, right? And that would also right, complicate, should we be practicing? And then how should I practice? So it's very important to determine whether or not grammar should be taught, can be learned, because otherwise it doesn't make much sense to practice, okay? Um, so um, I'm going to refer to my notes again in this lesson quite a bit. Um, one of the um, key course objectives for this course or student learning outcomes, right, is that as students you will improve your mastery of complex grammatical structures in Spanish, right? Another is that you'll acquire an inventory of strategies and resources that will help you to improve your control, right, and accuracy with these challenging forms. So, a big part of my approach to this course, right, I set out to design learning experiences, you can see on this slide, that encourage you as learners, as students, to increase your knowledge of the Spanish grammar system, increase your metalinguistic awareness, again, that's your awareness of your ability to reflect on, right, systematically the language structure, right, um, encourage you to assess your strengths and weaknesses, that of your grammatical competence, uh, to identify areas where you need to improve, to improve your mastery, and this is kind of the key point, right, one of the biggest objectives. Um, I designed the course to encourage you to improve your mastery of challenging forms and structures and to identify also and use quality resources for study and practice. In other words, the emphasis, the overriding objective for this course is for all of you as students to improve your grammatical competence, right? Um, so, but what does it mean, again, to improve mastery, right? Is that knowing more about grammar forms? Is that using language with better accuracy or control? becoming more fluent, all of the above, okay? A related but very important question is, are grammar structures something that can be taught and learned? If not, where does that leave us, right? Or if so, what works, okay? As it turns out, okay, as it turns out, these are some extremely complex questions to answer, and researchers haven't settled on a consensus. And of course, whether grammar can be taught and learned has implications for practice. Right? After all, why practice something if ultimately it's not going to stick? It's not going to help. We're not going to be able to call on it when we speak or write. Okay, okay. so I'm guessing that up until now, right, most of us have assumed that the more we learn about and practice grammar forms, the better we'll get at using them. We've all taken classes before. All of us have taken language classes before. And these classes have very often emphasized right, grammar. And we've assumed that we're getting better at it. Well, you might be surprised to learn, and that's what's represented on this slide, right? Our experience tells us that a big part about teaching and learning grammar is instruction in grammar. The more we study and practice grammar, the better we get at using it. You might be surprised to learn that SLA, SLA again is second language acquisition, right? Researchers don't agree about the effectiveness of instruction and practice on language development. Some researchers think that explicit instruction and practice has very little impact on learning and language use, while others do believe instruction is beneficial, but that its effectiveness may have limits and that many other factors come into play. In other words, they would say that the effectiveness of grammar instruction, right, instruction is, is necessary, it's important, but that its infective, effectiveness depends. Okay? All right, so to better understand why researchers don't agree on this and what the effectiveness of instruction and practice might depend on, it's helpful to briefly consider a few ideas from the field of second language acquisition research. So in presenting these, I'm not an expert necessarily on this area of research, right? I'm learning just like the rest of you. So in presenting these, my purpose is not to give you a comprehensive or definitive understanding of them, but rather just to introduce a few influential ideas 
that might help you to make more informed decisions about how you practice and learn. Again, might. Okay. So the first of these um, three key distinctions that I'm going to introduce is the distinction between implicit and explicit learning and knowledge. I'm sorry, there's a mistake on that slide that I'm going to actually correct right now in front of your very eyes. It should say explicit. That's a bad one. All right, so this first distinction is implicit versus explicit learning and knowledge. Okay, So implicit learning is learning that's acquired without our being aware of it. Right? This occurs incidentally or unconsciously. Implicit knowledge is intuitive, abstract knowledge. It can be called upon right, for use, but it can't necessarily be verbalized by learners. Explicit learning, on the other hand, is an intentional, deliberate, conscious process. We're trying to learn something. Explicit knowledge is knowledge about something, in our case, language, and it's a more conscious type of knowledge that's intentionally learned. So we have this distinction between implicit learning that's acquired and explicit learning that is learned. Okay? And also, you know something is explicit knowledge when a learner can verbalize it. For example, they can tell you the rule. right? English past tense, you add ed to the verb form or whatever. Okay? So this is a very this is a very fundamental distinction, right? Comes out of thinking in psychology and learning that second language uh, acquisition researchers very often refer to, right? Is a process implicit or explicit? Okay? So very much related to that distinction between implicit learning and explicit learning is this acquisition between this difference between acquisition versus learning. And this is more specific to the field of second language acquisition, language teaching, right? And this comes out of the, um, the theories of Stephen Krashen, right, who's a linguist. Um, and he proposed this, let's um, so hope I had some more notes on it here. Um, he proposed this um, model or theory of second language acquisition called the monitor model. So if you're curious about and you want to review, just Google, look up the Wikipedia article on the monitor model, Stephen Crasher. Crashin, it's very informative. So one of his key hypotheses, there are five hypotheses in his model, one of the key ones is the acquisition learning hypothesis or distinction, right? So again, this is related to implicit and explicit forms of knowledge. Acquisition, according to Crashin and many of his acolytes and disciples, right? Acquisition is that unconscious intuitive process, right? It results from exposure to comprehensible input. So the learner doesn't need to do anything special other than right, be exposed to and try to process that comprehensible input for meaning. Right? Um, so again, this kind of acquisition right, that would result theoretically in implicit knowledge, cr what Krashen would say is instruction does nothing to affect it. It's impervious to instruction. Right? Instruction can only promote learning, which I'll talk about in just a second. Right? Um, another part of his uh, monitor model, right, is the natural order hypothesis. So again, please Google, look up the Wikipedia article on crash and, and the monitor model. Um, the natural order hypothesis, right, states that learners acquire grammar structures in a universal order, right? Um, they're in their, in their native language, they're L1, but this also has implications for their second language, right? And so people that follow Krashen's theories would say that no matter how you teach someone, no matter how much you teach someone a structure that they're not ready to acquire, that instruction will have zero effect. Okay? Um, acquisition, that implicit knowledge that's been acquired right, um, unconsciously is, um, is what's used when somebody's speaking um, fluently, right, off the cuff, spontaneously, in a situation that's unexpected. They're drawing on their acquired system. Right? They're not accessing anything that they have learned okay, under Krashen's theory. Um, learning, on the other hand, like we just saw with explicit learning, right, is a conscious process. It involves awareness of structures and rules. And there's another hypothesis in the monitor model called the monitor hypothesis, right, in which Krashen states that what, what learners do with information that they've learned explicitly right, um, is that they use it to monitor their output. So as they're speaking, right, second language learners, for example, as they're speaking, they're using information that they've learned, right, metalinguistic information they've learned, and they're using that to check their production and make sure that they're producing as many mistakes, um, as few mistakes as possible. So we have this other distinction between acquisition and learning, which aligns very nicely with the distinction between implicit and explicit knowledge. 
Okay. Um, there's another um, opposition that's kind of important to keep in mind, I think, very informative and helpful, right? And um, competence versus performance. And if you want to look at more information about this, you would Google, for example, competence versus performance or linguistic competence. And the name connected with this would be Noam Chomsky, right? Extremely famous um, linguist from MIT, but also a political commentator has written many books on linguistics, syntax, but also politics. Um, so he makes this distinction between competence and performance, right? Um, he has a theory, right, called universal grammar, which basically is the idea, again, Google universal grammar, it's basically the idea that humans are hardwired, that there's a specific faculty in the human brain, right, that helps us to acquire language, right? On the basis of very limited um, input, we're able to produce, right, um, using this universal grammar, an infinite number of grammatical sentences. Okay, I'm really, really simplifying. <clears throat> but one of the one of the um, components of this is this distinction between competence and performance, right? Competence for Chomsky is the idealized linguistic capacity of native speakers. It's the information, right? that we have that we know about our native language, right? Or it could be about our second language. It's information about the language system in the minds of native speakers, right? It's what they know about the language. Performance, on the other hand, right? Performance is actual usage, what I'm doing right now, right? I'm engaging in performance, right? Which is just a reflection of the competence that I have in English. And so what he would say about performance is that performance is is imperfect, right? There's often, and you are seeing that in my speech, right? There's often mistakes, false starts, right? I might use a right, um, a wrong verb form. It doesn't mean necessarily that there's a systematic gap in my competence in English, right? Spanish or Portuguese would be another story. So again, three key distinctions, implicit, explicit learning, right? Acquisition, uh, learning, and competence, performance, and you can kind of see how they, they align in significant ways, okay? Um, okay, so some other factors that might affect the effectiveness of language instruction and therefore practice, because again, if instruction, if explicit learning are not effective, don't help us, right? What use is practice, okay? So in the second language acquisition research, right, many of these researchers have identified a few um, factors that, that do have an effect as well on the effectiveness of instruction, okay? Some performance mistakes. Um, one would be the age of learners, right? So there's a difference, right, in the effectiveness of instruction. Are we teaching young children, right? Or are we teaching adolescents, young adults, right? Um, their degree of proficiency. Where are they at on that proficiency scale or spectrum? when we're going to make that intervention and teach them something, okay? So again, they could, instruction could be more or less effective, okay? Um, these are things that you can look up on your own time. I'm just giving a very 30,000 foot overview. The developmental readiness of learners, okay? So instruction may help learners acquire forms that they're ready to acquire, but if they're not cognitively, right, if their development isn't at a particular stage, right, then many researchers would say, instruction is going to be completely ineffective, okay? And also getting back to that idea of natural order, the natural order hypothesis, right? Um, some researchers believe that instruction that would be out of sequence, so to speak, would not have an important impact, okay? Um, another thing to keep in mind is the difficulty of the structure itself, right? So maybe, and I might be getting this backward, but maybe very simple, rather straightforward structures, explicit instruction would be helpful, but more complex things, for example, when to use the subjunctive versus the indicative mood, instruction has less of an effect because of the processing, processing requirements of, of that feature, okay? And also, we have to keep in mind um, the type of language use or the particular task, right? So, um, are we looking at proficiency or performance, right? And if you're curious about this distinction, proficiency versus performance, it's, it's kind of similar related to the distinction of competence um, and um, performance or uh, acquisition and learning, right? And it's when you take, for example, a proficiency test, right? A test of your proficiency that's trying to elicit spontaneous 
unrehearsed right language. That's your proficiency, your ability to use spontaneously language in unrehearsed contexts. Whereas performance, right, is I'm taking a test or I'm taking an assessment in my language class where I more or less know, right, so it might be a semi-rehearsed. The distinction here is that proficiency is not tied to any instructional format or curriculum, whereas performance is, right? Performance is what happens in an instructional setting. In those cases, a lot of researchers would say in a performance context, explicit instruction is helpful, right? You've just had a unit on using the imperfect or the preterite to narrate and describe in the past, and now you're going to have a test. That explicit learning will help you to perform better on that test, but it might not help you in your proficiency when you step off the airplane in Mexico and there's an unexpected situation, right? You're going to call on your acquired system and it's not there, theoretically, okay? Um, so again, the specific language mode use or task, is it something where you have enough time, like you're writing an essay? You have time to call on that acquired system or that learned system, I should say, right? But if you're speaking spontaneously, you don't, okay? So these are different factors to keep in mind when you're discussing, right? the effectiveness of language instruction or grammar instruction, and therefore also the utility, right, the usefulness of practice. Okay, so speaking of practice, let's take, let's take a closer look at some practice strategies, right? Um, if you've taken a language class before, as I know all of you have, you're probably familiar with what's called the PPP model, right? This is what's used traditionally in language classes still very much today. That's when the instructor presents something, has you practice it, and then there's some kind of production activity where you have to use it, right? This is very common. It's a, it's a common type of explicit instruction, right? Um, there's also a distinction between isolated grammar instruction and integrated grammar instruction, right? Isolated grammar instruction is that kind of instruction where you focus on mechanical activities. They're sort of decontextualized. The focus is on the form. So, for example, when you walk into your Spanish 202 class and the instructor says, Hoy vamos a practicar con las formas del imperfecto y la distinción entre imperfecto y pretérito, right? And he gives you a worksheet or she gives you a worksheet and first you practice, right? Those are mechanical activities or your work in a workbook or an online component, right? Often those are decontextualized and the focus is just on whether or not you as a learner can produce forms after practice, right? Those are opposed to more communicative activities which might be done in a classroom that emphasizes communication, written or oral, usually oral, right? There's a context, right? And the focus really is on meaning, comprehension of input, communication, right? And there's, there's grammar forms are de-emphasized, right? But they may still be there, okay? So I think that when um, we're trying to determine what, what do we want to do to improve? Because that's really what I want to bring this video back to. What do we want to do to improve? What strategies which should we utilize? It's helpful to think about, well, there, there might be two systems in my mind, right? There might be an acquired system where I learn implicitly through exposure to input, authentic input in the target language. And there might be a learned system where that more mechanical, isolated, right? focus on forms kind of practice will help me build that up, right? So am I targeting my, you know, implicit learning or my explicit knowledge, right? And then matching strategies to those goals. Both systems would be good to target, right? It's not an either or, it's an and, okay? So for example, if you wanted to target, build up your implicit, right? Um, implicit learning system, right? The acquired system to use Krashen's terms, right? acquisition part. Um, you would simply expose yourself to input in the target language. You might watch, if it's Espanol, if it's Spanish we're talking about, you might watch uh, una telenovela, you might listen to a podcast in Spanish, right? You're paying attention, right? Um, but you're not necessarily focusing on any particular grammatical form, right? You're just simply processing that input for meaning. What's going on? What does it mean, right? So you're engaging in contextualized, authentic interpretation of that input, right? And, right, se supone que, right? Supposedly, you're, that's building up, right? Your implicit learning, your acquired system is being reinforced, right? Um, or, right, if you were targeting your learned system, as we often will be in this class, right? We're gonna study language rules, right? Um, 
we're going to look at input, right? We might read or something like that, but we're paying attention. We're looking for specific forms, right? Oh, while I'm reading this, I'm really going to try to see how they use the imperfect versus the preterite, or what prepositions. I'm going to circle some of the verb endings, whatever that might be. We're processing input, not so much for meaning, but primarily for forms, right? That would contribute to our learned system, right? So we're looking for patterns, we're forming generalizations, um, we're connecting those to rules, or we're making new rules in our minds, right? And then practicing the production of forms. So almost everything that we do in the textbook, right? Those actividades de análisis y de práctica, right? They go under this practicing production of forms or studying language rules. They are contributing to our explicit knowledge, our learned system. Okay? But feel free to do some of the other things, right? Some of the more incidental types of, uh, of learning. Okay, so I had a bunch of research that I was going to introduce into this and I was going to quote from, from some studies, but I'm going to leave that for the graduate students in the next video. If you're curious, watch video number five on teaching developments. Um, so let's, let's talk about some conclusions because again, the, the main questions I wanted to answer here is, should I be practicing? Is practicing worthwhile? If so, how, right? Um, should grammar be taught? Um, most serious researchers in second language acquisition who link it to um, language learning and instruction would say, yes, that simple exposure to input without any kind of guidance, right, without any kind of instruction is, does help, but it's not sufficient, okay? So yes, grammar should be taught. The question is, right, how? And I'll address that a little bit more in my next lesson, in my next video. Can it be learned? Yes, but with a few caveats, right? We've just seen that learning can be divided into different sort of conceptualizations, right? Are we talking about implicit learning or explicit learning, right? Are we talking about acquisition or learning, competence or performance? So it can be learned as long as we define what we mean by learning, okay? Should I practice? Yes, you should, right? Um, you should practice because you can, de depending on the type of practice that you do, you will be building up your implicit acquired system or you will be reinforcing, right, or building up your explicit learned system, okay? So how should I practice? Um, I recommend um, practicing um, TART like I just mentioned, matching those practice strategies to specific goals, right? I want to work on something that will lead to increased proficiency. Maybe then you're going to beef up the amount of exposure to authentic input in the target language, right? And just count on, rely on the fact, right, the theory, or the theory that as you do so, right, you're watching TV, you're listening to music, right, you might be singing, all that kind of stuff. As you do so, your implicit system is building up, and when you're in an unexpected situation where you need to communicate spontaneously, that's going to take over, right? Or if you want to prepare for a performance assessment, an exam, get lots of points in this class, then that more mechanical, isolated, focus on forms practice is beneficial. So hopefully this has been a useful video. Um, remember, there will be a quiz on Blackboard covering some of these concepts. Um, should grammar be taught? Can it be learned? Yes, yes. Should I practice? You should. How should I practice? That's up to you. But think more intentionally about your acquired versus your learned system. That's it for this video. Hope you've enjoyed it, found it to be useful. And if not, that's okay. You still got to take the quiz anyways, all right? Best of luck. Ciao. Adios.